Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Ken Yurish, MD, PhD. Uh, Ken is one of that rare breed of people that does research, but also is a high volume surgeon. Ken, welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be here today. Good to have you. Um, and I'm really excited for this. So just for our listeners, this is actually our second time recording this episode. So I'm sure the conversation will be a little bit different. Unfortunately, we had an audio card failure last time. Uh, but one of the things I try to do on this is just be honest and genuine. So it'll be it'll be much more polished, right? It's almost like we've had this conversation before. <laughs> yeah, it'll be like deja vu. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think we'll probably touch on a couple new points, hit some of the old ones because we we discuss some really good stuff. But you can't replicate that stuff exactly. So yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. So just to kind of go into it, um, I think one of the things I asked that was that was kind of a good start was. Um, how did you get into what you're doing now? So I guess, you know, what, what's been your journey? Um, how did you go down that path? Yeah, no, so, you know, for a little bit of background, uh, so I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Um, the, my specialty focus is with hip and knee replacements. So it's about like more than 95% of my clinical practice. And I split my time right between on. the lab and then also with, um, with, my, with the clinical practice. Um, and so... Um, it, the lab is really focusing on the problems that we see in the OR. Um, so it's very focused on uh, outcomes with uh, joint replacements and hip and knee replacements. And then um, in the clinic, like I said before, it's mostly, you know, it's hip and knee replacement. And um, so, you know, for background, uh, knee replacements and hip replacements are the largest major surgical procedure in the United States right now. I didn't know that actually. Yeah, no, so, cool. yeah so it's very, very high volume. There's a lot of them that needs to be done. And from an engineering perspective, really, really interesting. Uh, a I lot agree. of, the, yeah, a lot of the, <laughs> uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the design problems that people have encountered, uh, solutions to help solve them, and then a lot of the next steps to sort of kind of bring about the next generation of technology. You know, so so my background, um, I was always interested in medicine, also interested in engineering. Ended up doing my undergraduate degree in chemical engineering. Nice. Uh, found that I was still really interested in medicine, so went on into medicine. Um, but along the way, realized that I was really interested in the research end. Uh, and so um, for medical schools, you can actually do a joint degree between your MD and your PhD. I've known a few people that have gotten that. Yeah, it's an interesting program for sure. Yeah, no, there, it's, 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 there's more and more of them out there. It's sponsored by the NIH. Okay, um, I didn't know that part. Yeah, that's and awesome. so, so they just cover the, the tuition completely? Uh, yeah, more or less, yeah. That's awesome. It's, 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 it's more of there's... The, to make the training feasible because yeah. it takes so much longer to get your PhD, you need something to help kind of cover. I believe that it's it's truncated though from if you were to do both in sequence, right? Um, well, it's um, it's they overlap, right? Yeah. And so there's a lot of things on the PhD side that you can get done during the first part of med school, and there's a few things on the med school side that you can still kind of keep on rolling while you're in the PhD land. So that's it, cool. It it. it it, it, it kind of smashes the two together. So you save some time because that, that overlap is, is time gain. But I'm sure what you save in time, you lose in sleep deprivation. Yeah, more or less. You, know, <laughs> you can, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a little portion of your soul at some point in there, one way or the other. I believe it. I mean, you know, you only live so many years and that's a big chunk of them. But <laughs> hopefully very worthwhile. Yeah. And um, so uh, ended up in the MD, PhD program at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, the lab I was in was very focused on uh, adult stem cells nice. and going through it, I, you know, my background uh, in bioengineering now became really interested in computer vision uh, and robotics. And so coming out of that also found that I was very interested in orthopedic surgery. And that's sort of where the marriage between uh, robotics and um, uh, AI and uh, hip and knee replacement kind of started to slowly come together through residency. Um, then I did my fellowship up in Boston at MGH nice. uh, with everyone up there, and now I'm back here at the University of Pittsburgh. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's uh, you probably have accomplished more in the time you've been around than most people do in like two lifetimes. No, no, I appreciate. I mean, those are yeah. kind words, but uh, it's just fair it's, enough. I'm just saying, saying what I see. Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of you know, it's marching along. It's so it's been fun. Problem. It's like the ultimate yeah. engineering, right? It's yeah. Um, you know, engineers like to solve problems, and you know, it's just it's you see the next problem, and you just sort of start to pick it off. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, I was kind of, I was, I had another call that I, I snuck in uh, leading up to this where I was talking to someone else. I'm like, I'm interviewing this guy. It's awesome. He's a real engineer and also like a surgeon that does surgeries. And 
you know, I mean, as you know, I'm an engineering manager and I, I consider myself an engineer. I was kind of thinking about it last night and like, we're all engineers. Like anybody yeah. that builds things and wants to advance technology in a way that's kind of hands-on and, and less on the science side, I think is an engineer. And yeah. so, and the scientists probably, I mean, there's a gray area there. And so, you know, I don't know it's interesting. So, uh, yeah, it's just, I don't know. I mean, I'm obviously uh, have a lot of respect for your work. I don't want to, you know, harp too much on that because I feel like it's sort of circular. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so that's that's awesome. That sounds like quite a journey. Um, so what does your day-to-day -day look like, I guess, now that you're practicing at UPMC? Yeah, so I spend about... Um I probably spend about a little bit, a little bit more than half my time in the clinic. It you know it, it varies week to week, but about half my time in the clinic, half the time in the lab. Um, you know my clinic time is probably about half actually in the clinic clinic, and then half the time in the OR. Cool. And then uh, everything in the lab it just becomes a, a huge kind of uh, balance between you know what's in the lab and getting everything else done. And I so. guess just even though I grew up around medicine, so my my father's a orthopedic surgeon as well and okay. my granddad uh, cardiologist go. and so well, that's that's your affinity to all this right I, I think it is right so I mean well it's you know I'm, I'm not them and I didn't live their experiences and you know I, I I'm a different guy but I still grew up around it and so I think that's one of the reasons I'm so comfortable talking to doctors and, and I kind of know some of the language and I also I mean I I, I was proximate to it I, I grew up you know like around medicine and you know you know seeing stethoscopes and the you know backseat of the car and stuff and Anyway, you know, my dad was on call. He'd wake up at four in the morning, you know, kicking mm -hmm. the side of the bed, you know, because he had to go into the OR. And but one thing I, I it's never been clear to me, and this is because I'm still a layperson, is is what's the difference between the clinic and the OR? I, I guess I know that's pretty elementary, but I'm curious. Oh, uh, well, yeah, you know, it's you know, an important. You know, people think of surgery as being the hard part of surgery as being what you're doing in the OR, but you know, an equally important part is is selecting. You know, somebody comes in with a problem. And it's it's the indications. What's you know what what should we manage non-operatively, and what do, what do we need to take to the OR, and, and and how do we get it there safely? And that's pretty much all. And so half the clinic is people that haven't had surgery yet, and figuring out you know what's the next step with this problem. And they have knee pain, they have hip pain, and you know eighty, you know, gosh, more than eighty percent of the stuff I see is it's non-operative stuff. It's someone that has knee pain that you know is never going to need a knee or a hip replacement. And it's it's, it's 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 what can we do to keep them really health keep them really healthy and increase their wellness and handle this from a non-operative perspective. And then the other 20%, it's, well, you've tried all of this non-operative stuff, but it's still not working. So how do we safely take them to the OR? And, makes sense. You know, and then the other part of clinic is now you've had surgery and how can we safely get you out of the, the post-surgical portion of all of this and rehab the knee or the hip and get you back to where you were before and doing really what you want to do. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, I appreciate no, it. You know, it. It's actually, it's a lot of fun. Um, a lot of things in orthopedics are very short term, right? So, you know, classically we fix fractures. Yeah. And once the fractures heal, they're, you know, you're, you're done. It's taken care of, which is really satisfying. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's the nice thing with hip and knee replacement is it's really very much a lifetime relationship where, you know, it's, you know, somebody has a knee or a hip and you're going to be monitoring this indefinitely, just making sure that it's, it, you know, it's, it's a piece of machinery that it's working. Yeah, it makes really. sense. And so it's, it's a lot of fun. You, it's, um, it, it's a neat way to really, uh, get to know somebody. That's awesome. So there's, there's a lot of directions we could take this and, um, I, I guess we just pick a lane and run down yeah, it. Why not? Uh, yeah. I mean, life's too short not to. So what I'm thinking is, um, we, we started to talk last time, and I thought this was kind of a fun conversation, so I'll bring it back up again about um, robotic surgeries. So, yeah. And, and it kind of gets into the, the outcomes, right? And so I'd mentioned before that I was at the dinner table with my father one time, and him and my aunt, who's like the head of stem cell, she, there's a Krauss lab at Yale. I don't know this position. I'm probably getting her position wrong. Yeah. But she does a lot of stem cell stuff at Yale. I, that's about all I know about her <laughs> position. It's, it's a little bit uh, above my pay grade, we'll say. And so, um, anyway, uh, so we we're both talking and, and he especially espoused this point of view that, you know, robotic surgery is kind of a gimmick and, you know, manual surgeons are good enough at it. And like, you know, it's something the hospital can use to draw more patients because they can say they have the latest and the greatest, but it isn't necessarily making much of a difference. 
I know you had a little bit of a different opinion, or you know, maybe it's not that different, but it's it's kind of up in the air. I just wanted to get your perspective. Well, on you that. know, now that we're that we've talked about this before, you know, my, my first question is like your you know your entire specialty is inside robotics and building machines. <laughs> you know, and I, I would have said, you know, Dad, you think everything I do is just marketing? <laughs> well, I I, I kind of did, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. You know, it's like, but I have to respect his perspective yeah. as a high volume orthopedic surgeon as well. Yeah. I mean, Done a lot of knee and hip and shoulder replacements, so I, you know, I was just like, "All right, well, clearly you've been around it more than me. You must know something I don't." No, I mean, and this is, you know, I, I think the 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 kind of the, the higher level concept is yeah. we we don't exactly we, we don't have the best data yet on where we should be using robots and where we shouldn't be using robots. That makes a lot of sense. And um, you know, uh, just having a robot in the OR doesn't make a mediocre surgeon good, right? So a robot yeah. can make a good surgeon theoretically better or the same. Yeah. And having a robot in the room can make a bad surgeon, you know, may, theoretically, hopefully better, but it could also make a bad surgeon, you know, if you have more confidence than you need to, it can make a bad surgeon worse. So it's almost like the bumpers in the bowling alley. I yeah. Think, or, you know, like, you, yeah, you might bounce that ball around just because you can, but it doesn't mean that... You it's going to make you really good at what you do. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. Um, and, you know, so one of the, you know, this is, we, we do a lot of clinical studies in our lab. And so one of the big things we're looking at right now is where is the best spot to be using a robot and, and how it, you, a robot's not going to, it's not going to make you any better than you already are, but it's a very useful, you know, just like any robot, it's a really useful yeah. tool to do something more precisely. Yeah. And so if you're doing something with more precision and accuracy, where can we use that to really improve the patient experience and their outcome? That makes a lot of sense. You know, and, and they're, they're, you know, using a robot on every single total knee that comes through the door is probably not going to be the answer, at least you know, in any time in the near future. That makes um, sense. But there, there's groups of patients, and you know, a lot of the stuff that we're looking at are younger, more high demand patients, where they're going to be a little bit more sensitive to small differences in the balance or the kinematics with their knee. You know, how the knee moves through its range of motion from when your knee is completely extended until when it's all the way flexed. Yep. You know, and if it's more precisely balanced. If you're recovering faster, you can get more out of it. You're going to be more satisfied with your outcome later on. Just to, to kind of go down a tangent there, and we spoke a bit about kinematics last time, and, and you did yeah. a good job describing it yeah. just then. But are you trying to replicate the body's natural, uh, I guess, yes. range of motion? Or, okay, so just as it, close as you can get to how it was. As close, not the range of motion, but their, but the, the kinematics of your knee. Yeah, yeah. No, and people so think of your range knee Range of like motion is how far it can go. Kinematics is how it does it? Yeah, and, okay. and, and, and sort of context, it's, it's tension. Really, yeah, yeah. Somewhat different definition, but still similar. In well, yeah, for you, it's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, people think of your knee as this hinge that just, you know, extends and flexes. Yeah. But I mean, actually, and if you take your knee and if as you kind of go through your range of motion, yeah. you're, you're actually your knee is rotating through space during your normal kind of gait. You know, yeah. so you land with your heel extended. And then as you're yeah. rotating it, it's actually, you know, as you're kind of coming down on it, it's like your knee is actually twisting through space. So it's actually That's awesome. so not only is it, you know, rot it not only is it flexing and extending, but it's rotating as it's doing this. Yeah. And so it's really dependent on the tension that it sees going across it. And that's why, you know, that's where. You know, everyone talks about their knee ligaments, your MCL, your LCL, your ACL, your PCL. And then you also have your quadriceps and your hamstrings that are kind of, you know, it's, it's literally, it's like a tensioning device. That makes sense. Just kind of dialing it in as it's going through. Um, and, and so the thought process is that if you're putting them in, uh, if you have a, you know, if you have a better accuracy with how you're balancing the knee through its range of motion, then you're going to have more, more normal kinematics, which will give you a more normal knee. Um, cool. And the, the, the thought process behind this is that knees work very well. If you, you know, for the right indications, the majority, the vast majority of the people are going to be very satisfied with their knee. But there's still, in the, the, the statistics we use is it's roughly 15 You're to 20. You're referring to replacement knees. Yeah, like yeah, the yeah. The companion bit. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, the knee replacement. And so, you know, 15 to 20 percent, yes, this is better, but I'm still not really completely satisfied with this. And there's a portion where no matter what you do, maybe they won't be completely satisfied. But there's another portion where, you know, if, if you could maybe somehow be a little bit more like their normal knee, yeah. that's probably what they're missing. And that's kind of like the holy grail behind a knee. Um, if I do a hip replacement on somebody, six months later, a year later, they've forgotten that they've had a hip replacement. They, and we call it hip amnesia. You forgot that you had surgery. That's interesting. I never heard that term before. Yeah. And, and so a lot of this interest behind robots is, is if, we, if we put them in better, 
can we get closer to hip amnesia where you also have hip amnesia where it doesn't feel quite as mechanical as a normal knee? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, and, and there's a lot of people that do have knee amnesia, but there's a lot of people that are like, yes, this is much better than it was before. I can do all these things, you know, like I'm, I'm golfing again, I'm riding my bike. That's awesome. Yep, I'm you know, on the elliptical. It's so good to give that back to people. Oh, it's, you know, it's the best because they were really missing it. Yeah. But then they go, you know, it's great, I'm doing all these things, but it's, it's not quite like it was before. Yeah. And that's, and, and so kind of getting back to the conversation you were having that, you know, how much of this is marketing? There's definitely, there's, you know, hospitals use this of like, look, we have a robot, right? Yeah. But it's, it's the same thing with any type of other engineering thing. It's, look, we have this really great shiny tool <laughs> and sometimes that tool is very, very useful. And sometimes it's, it's just a tool. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, it's sense. another thing on your tool belt. You could have a Fabergé egg as a paperweight. You know, yeah. It would still be a paperweight. Exactly. <laughs> it's just a really expensive paperweight. Yeah. You know? uh, and, yeah, so, I mean, that's, it's, that's sort of the fun part that we're doing in the lab is trying to identify who does really well with this. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of data out there that the people that aren't into robotics talk about. And this is when it was more computer navigation of just making sure you're putting it in straight that showed that, as, that you don't get any better results than if you were a high volume surgeon that's putting them in the right way. Um, but there's a lot of data that's starting to come out. And a great example is, um, so in Australia, they have a registry where anybody that gets a hip and knee replacement, um, they get put into this big database and they monitor outcomes. Interesting. That's probably awesome for the science. Yo, like, yeah, well, it, it's, it's a really art. great way to get a snapshot of what's going on at a larger level. Yeah. And so if they look at the first five or six years, and so it's easier to see patterns before you'd see them in other types of clinical studies because you're, you're seeing everybody, right? And so you can just do... You can just do a curve of how many of these knees are still in and how many of them need to be revised. Now, what do we do in the States? That, I, I, again, I don't mean to derail, but yeah. this is interesting. Like, what's, what's, what do we do here that's different from that? Is it just HIPAA kind of gets in the way of... No, it's actually... So, they've been doing it longer. So, there's okay. actually the... Um, uh, there's It's called the AGRR. But see, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, we call it AAOS. They actually AOS. have their own registry that they call now the AGRR. Um, which is actually starting to do this, you know, it's starting to replicate We've a lot of We've just mimicked these... Australia's at this point, it sounds like. Um, it, it's, no, there, there, there are nuances that are very, very different. So there's a number of registries out there. Okay. It takes a huge amount of um, manpower and organization to make these registries work. That makes a lot of sense. You know, and so smaller countries especially have had them for longer. Um, and, you know, so it's, it, we're doing this now in the United States. It's just not as old Interesting. as the Australian registry because they've been doing it longer. It's almost like your size gets in the way of, of feasibility of implementing something on that kind of scale. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And um, so we, if, you start, if you're looking at the Australian registry data, you, now that they're out at five or six years of, you know, in, especially in Australia, they're very into navigation and robotics. They're starting, they don't see a difference between, if you look at all knees that were done manually uh, with normal kind of conventional instrumentation, yeah. and you look at all the ones that have been done with a robot, um, all together, all comers, they don't really see a difference in outcome. Yeah. Um, but if you select out, these are the young, higher demand patients, you actually start to see a statistically difference, a, a statistically significant difference in survival outcomes. It's basically how long has that knee been able to be is in there? Is that just because they're alive for longer so you can see that? Or well, no, this is over the first five years. Oh, right? I see, okay. And so it's just, there's a smaller, it, it, these are very fine numbers, but there's there's a higher rate, What it, the data is implying is that there's a higher rate of revision if you're doing that. And th this is small. Patient. In the younger patient, but That's this is like one it's point. It's counterintuitive, I guess. Still, I'm a layperson. I don't know what it exactly looks like. Well, no, the higher in, in the conventional. So if you do oh, it with a robot, there's a lower there's a there's a there's a lower incidence of it having to have some type of second surgery for whatever reason. I got it. so and, that was a misconception. Yeah. For some reason, I thought you were benchmarking older and younger patients. No, no, no. This is just if you take when you look at all comers, you don't see a difference between the two, and then in younger patients that are more high demand and more active, if that makes sense, if they're having a robotic. Uh, if they're having something robotic or navigation being done with their knee, they're using that as a tool. It, it, they have a lower incidence of having to have some type of revision surgery after the fact. That makes a lot of sense. But these are also very fine numbers. So you need something like a registry where you're capturing thousands of patients to see these very fine well, it, differences. It sounds like at least the, the probable reason for that is that they're beating on it more. Like, like they're just seeing more active use. And so it, exactly. it, it gets more cycle times. Yeah. Yeah. That and you know they're they they they're doing more with it. So if you compare somebody that has you know a knee replacement and they're forty, and you compare it to somebody that's eighty five, those are 
two very different levels of activity, right? That makes a lot of sense. So yeah. I, I, I counterintuitively, I guess the reason I, I thought it would be the other way is I figure the body's not as good at healing as you age. But I guess that is outweighed by the amount of activity and yeah. stress you put on it when, yep. you're, when you're younger. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and so, you know, it's that's sort of like, the, that's, and it, 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 which is, you know, it, it, we were, um, you know, it really gets into a lot of the larger concepts with robotics in general in terms of, you know, you've got this great, useful tool, but, you know, in some places it's going to be very useful and in some places it's a really expensive paperweight. <laughs> That makes sense. And I'm sure you've never seen one of those. Never, never. I've never <laughs> seen anything that was purchased frivolously and didn't see any use. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in my workshop, right? <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> anyway, no, that's, um, yeah, for sure it happens. And uh, I've, I've seen lots and lots of examples of that in my career. And uh, even in this very room that we're in. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that exists. So earlier in the conversation, you mentioned that uh, you did some early work in machine learning, and, and that's kind of particularly interesting to me for a few reasons. One is, as a roboticist, people often call me thinking that um, robotics and machine learning are the same thing, and they, they want machine learning built. And the good news is we recently brought in some really intelligent people that can do that work uh, because we just kept getting hit up for it. And so yeah, it's not my specialty, but we have some people in the group that are good at it. Um, but it is sometimes frustrating to be educating clients and, and peers about the differences between the two fields. But I don't want to harp too much on that. I guess I'd be interested in how machine learning has played into your work and what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, well, it's almost like a robot is a machine that knows how to learn. Correct. In some <laughs> cases, they don't always. So you can yeah. have robots that are rules-based, where it's just like, if this, then do exactly that, and there's no adaptivity. But you can also have you know, automatic tuning is probably a very simple example. It's all math, and yeah. just changing uh, coefficients, right, and, and equations is, is what it appears to be at the base level. You obviously you know more than me. I don't want to put my foot. Well, no, I mean you know, it's it, it's we were kind of talking before about um, you know robots as being a very useful tool uh, and and having the right problem to solve where it makes you know, you do a better job doing it. And it's the same thing with machine learning or you know, or um, or artificial intelligence, right? Yeah. And and you know it's this the same things happening that, that same kind of pattern that you're talking about between you know robots as just being a marketing thing. It's also happening on the AI side where you know, there's a lot of stuff with AI out there. It's, it's just, it's a hot topic. And so, yep. you know, we're going to throw some AI in there and now, you know, it's good. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like 60% of the time it works every time. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. And, uh, and 60% not good odds, by yeah. the way. <laughs> so, it's a statistics game, right? Yeah, exactly. No, and so it's like I garner hype curve where yeah. you see how many <laughs> companies are paying. Our AI is going to, you know, like make your microwave work. Do you really need AI for that? Yeah, and, and you know, so you know, so I, so the tail end of my of uh, a lot of the uh, computer vision I was doing, you know, just naturally got into machine learning before AI was even a hot topic. And it's you know, in machine learning and classification is just you know, it's a component of AI. Um, cool. And so always in the background, there's been a little bit of this machine learning or AI that I've always been sort of working on. And 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 so you you see the same patterns emerge, right? That. Um, that there's this problem. And, and, and so on both sides of it, we have a problem and we need a tool to solve it. And it's a pattern recognition issue, right? And so yeah. you can do your, your very straightforward analytical, um, old, you know, more analog, right? Where it's, we, we have this well-defined technique that will solve this problem for us and it gives us a solution from you know, these inputs and now we have this output that's a solution that's versus, awesome. you know, we have a whole lot of variables, and so we're going to use some machine learning or a classification technique. You know, it quotes like AI, and it will recognize the pattern and it will give us this solution. So, just to kind of restate it and make sure I'm tracking correctly, I think what you're saying is that AI can be used, and I'm familiar with some of this research, but I just want to sort of say it out loud. Um, so, AI can be used to make sense of things by looking at patterns. Yes. And, and sort of just drawing conclusions based on a reference set of data. So like, you know that this is supposed to be that, or like, you know, like a, I don't know, like a broken fibula looks a certain way. And so yeah. you showed a ton of x-rays, like broken fibula, not a broken fibula, broken fibula, you know, and like that hot dog, not a hot dog example from Silicon Valley. And yeah. So <laughs> I, um, is that basically how it works or am I, I'm sure I'm missing a ton of nuance and legwork and science. No, I mean, that's, that's, that's a big, you know, there's always like the, the there's always the, um, uh, the, uh, the nuances with everything. 
Um, you know, and so you're, you're talking about, you know, a, whether there's a ground truth or like do we have a training data set where we can train the logarithm, you know, whatever you want to call it to recognize what the pattern is cool. and then give it a completely new data set and it can just start picking out, oh, that's like that thing that I saw over here. And I so see. it's, you know, it's, it, and it could be, it could be binaries, yes or no, or it can have that fuzzy logic where it's, awesome. you know, it's. Yes, yeah, sort of. <laughs> like sixty three percent. Yeah, yeah. That's probably how that feeds. Yeah, you know, and then you also have your audit, and that's where you're providing it the training set. And then there's also the, the the kinds where it's completely automated, where it trains itself, and you know it kind of has its own kind of nuances to figure out how to do it. I, this is a really interesting topic. So I, um, I guess what I'm wondering is when you train a fuzzy logic uh, system. Do you train it with binary data? Are you like, this is a yes, and then it starts to see shades of gray, or do you trade it with shades of gray? Like, how do you, I'm sure maybe there's more than one approach. Yeah, you. that's actually, I don't do as much stuff with fuzzy logic, so. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I saw that term a lot in the 90s, and when I was reading, like, technical magazines as a kid. Yeah, yeah. I never really knew what it meant. Or yeah, the zero, you know, it's, it. it's not zero, it's not one, it's somewhere in the middle. But, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, I, so, I mean, I, I, the, I like to use that term because, you know, everything, has some type of you know it's a probabilities game right and so yeah. it's like it's not yes it's not no it's like it's it's like a magic eight ball it's like eh, chances are highly likely <laughs> <laughs> except the magic eight ball is completely random <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this, although surprisingly accurate sometimes <laughs> that's a good point i don't know I, I and again not to go too far off the deep end but i'm gonna do it anyway i feel like a lot of that stuff like is sort of written in such a way where it could apply to anything so like you know, does she love me? Yes. You know, well, in some ways, she probably does. Like, does she love me? No. Well, in some ways, she probably doesn't. You know, yeah. so if you analyze the problem, I think you can make it fit. Like, I, I don't know if that, if I'm just talking. Yeah. No. Here. I mean, you. Know, and so the you know, the the big problem, and this is maybe uh, how getting the right answer. You know, so the hard part about AI is getting a useful answer when you're outside of your training data or outside of like the, when you're, you're building the logarithm. And you know, it's one of the, the nuances I've seen on the medicine side is that you can overfit your model, right? So, Interesting. you know, you, you can give it so much data that it, it will be impossible for it to find you know, to, to not come up with the right answer because it becomes overfitted, right? So does that mean like a slight outlier just isn't gonna get picked up? Uh, no, it's just that it's, it becomes so specific for that situation that in your training set, it's going to work perfectly. But then when you take it out of the real world, it's so constrained that it can't deal so with So it's not even an outlier. It's just a picture from a different angle. Yeah. Or like, okay. I yeah. See. That's interesting. Yeah. That's definitely what they don't tell you in the Terminator movies. <laughs> yeah. No, and it, it, it's, it's interesting seeing how all this stuff is developing now because, you know, you know, I feel like I'm getting really old, but like a decade ago, it was, you know, it's Maybe always, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's always like the, you're never going to be as far as you think you are at five years, but at 10 years, you're way further than you ever thought you'd be because of like kind of the direction you end up going. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I've seen it go both directions where like sometimes, you know, you're, I was way off, right? A few years ago, I was like, uh, this is probably... Seven years ago, I said in five years, everyone's going to, like, we're just going to have self-driving cars fully deployed. And I guess that's sort of true. Like Tesla Well, around Pittsburgh, product. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. well, that's it. I had a very biased you yeah. know, set of data. My, my, is it correct to say my ground truth was off? Like, yeah. That was, that, was, that was a Carnegie Melon. I was in Pittsburgh. Yeah, no, it's like all you like, saw were automated cars driving all around campus. Yeah. People in Tempe probably thought that, too, or in the <laughs> Bay Area, like they're near Waymo, you know, and so... Yeah, I guess. Yeah, and, and, yeah. But our, 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 our expectations behind how they would operate, like, you know, and, and this is not my area especially. My, mine neither. But, you know, they've completely... Bias robotics is, but not self-driving cars in particular. Yeah, but with, um, you know, by having the, um, the, 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 is it LIDAR? LIDAR? LIDAR, LIDAR yeah. So by having the LIDAR on there, they've just basically completely mapped out, you know, and that's not how, like, when this was getting started, that's not how anybody, you know, at least when I... You, know, you saw these things going around. I'm like, oh, wow, they're going to have this really complex computer vision and they're going to be able to recognize these objects and they're going to be able to track them. That's kind of what the Tesla them. guys are doing. I mean, yeah. I mean I'm, I'm sure it's, you know, there's probably, they're 
doing certain tricks to make it easier than it seems. But yeah, but I mean, you know, on the top of all these cars, you know, the, the ones that are being tested right oh, now, for sure. you've got this like huge thing on the roof. Eighty-five thousand dollar Velodyne sensor. I think yes. it's the sixty-four HE is the one that looks like a UFO that uh, Uber likes. Yeah. And then those little pucks that you'll see. I can't remember who uses them, but you, you spot it. You know the one I'm talking about. It, it, they actually call it a puck. It's it's like the VLP sixteen. Like how big? It's, it's, is it like, like a size of a version. puck? So it's like that big around, and it's like that tall, and um, it it's it's a lower cost option. So I think in volume they're around six grand, and then at the single quantity they're like twelve grand. Okay. So I, because I'm an engineering program manager, I'll often try to guess what the sensor suite costs in some of these cars. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a fun little game. But you know, then that was it, that's a great example of just trying to overfit you know, collect as so much stuff as possible. It's got to be overwhelming to analyze. That. Yeah, that that now you've got this, but you you can take that same self driving car and it's not going to perform nearly as well if you put it in a different city where it doesn't have that rich data set. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's meant to be some data set, and, and again, I'm speculating because I'm not a self driving yeah. car specialist. We're gonna get many angry. Emails, I'm sure we'll letters. get plenty of hate if this yeah. podcast gets enough viewership for that to happen, which I hope it does. You know, and we send your hate mail to uh, a trash can right over <laughs> podcasts. I think at sk is is the actual address. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, solutions parallel, but I, I don't want to harp on that too much. But. No, but yeah. You know, so I've 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 had a lot of fun looking at these areas of AI where it's starting to be used a lot more because I, I'm assuming that the same thing is going to start to be echoed at some point with medicine where yeah. there's this interest of, hey, this, you know, medicine is a great example of an area of a field that has just enormous quantities of data. Oh, yeah. And how you start to kind of, you know, use that to find different solutions. It'll be interesting. Yeah. So It'll be just like robotics. Like some of it will be marketing and some of it will be a very useful tool and it's just you know, it's, it's learning how to use it the right way. So you'd mentioned the databases uh, for, for knee replacement surgeries in particular in the U.S. National Australia. And I apologize, I can't recall the acronyms at present. But a lot of the data I grew up with, so I was helping out my dad's office in the 90s, is they had physical paper charts for patients. Oh, yeah. So it was like a folder on the wall. And me and other children that were far too young to be working legally, but I think they paid us some candy. And you know, yeah. the parents, they raised me and paid for everything. I could, I could <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being paid in food, right? Yeah, and it, it was actually kind of bad. They gave us like 20 cc syringes, but without the needles. And we would use them like super soakers. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, I'll take that. I'll, I'll, use, I'll use a 20, you could do a 100 cc syringe. Give it to yeah. our kids. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't see them in the, in, the, in the drawer. Like I didn't see those around, but if they had them, those would have been way better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, it was a lot of fun. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So but anyway, I grew up around these paper charts. I still see them in like some vet clinics. Like I, I uh, had a friend that worked in a vet clinic and they, they were still using them, but is the majority of that is a lot of that data coming from like uh, electronic medical records or is it is it yeah databases you know this is like this historical thing where this is where it makes me feel really old now because the yes yeah, so when when i was a medical student um everything was all paper-based um you, there's this thing on the floor where you have to do orders right so uh, a patient needs a certain new medication yeah um yeah i don't know like they're you know they need uh, you know, some some certain milligrams of Lasix or whatever, right? So like a prescription? Yeah, well, yeah, but it's it's like you're giving it to them on the floor. So okay. it's, it's an order. You know, we call it an order of like they need the medication X. Yeah. And so you used to write their order out on this. It, it was an order sheet. It was just basically a sheet of paper that had all these lines on it. And you just write, you know, we need this, we need this, we need this. Yep. And there would be a... Um, a stamp, like just like the old credit card machines, where it would be there. <laughs> yep, exactly, yeah. the exact same thing. Which uh, yeah, you kind of see around a little bit every now and then. Yeah. And yeah, you'd you'd put their name on it because you'd write their orders, and then you'd 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 do the swipe of whatever that thing's called, and, and it would be given to the nurse. Yeah. And you know, like that's how the whole thing operated. And you know, since then, you know, everything's electronic now. Yep. You know, like there is no, and there's certain parts of the medical record that that still are paper. But, you know, every year, it's less and less. Yeah, and I know this isn't the same thing, but my PCP won't even give me a paper script anymore. Yeah. You know, it's it's got to be electronically transmitted. That's yep. probably a good thing in a lot of ways. Yeah, well, there's parts of it that are very fit. There's parts, I, I there's, you know, it's, it's another good example between, you know, if you have the, the, the conventional way, like the old way of doing things, yeah. and the new, like, robotic AI, like whatever the new technology <laughs> is, right? Yeah. You know, there, there's certain efficiencies. Yeah, there, yeah, there's certain efficiencies. 
but there, there's certain things that you miss on the old. Like there's there's parts I liked writing the script out and just kind of hey, this is it. Unsatisfied about tearing yeah. the thing. Yeah. yeah, it's it's like the same thing between a book and an ebook, right? Like there's it's oh, kind of yeah. nice holding a book sometimes. I like writing. I, I've kind of gotten away from it in recent years, but I, I used to be so adamant about writing paper. I still do it when I'm in the field. So if I'm at like a client site or a prospect site, and just like sketching it testing out, testing things. Yeah, in a lake or in in, hmm. in, in, in the, the woods or something. If we're trying out a new system. You can't have a laptop with you, really, because it's, it's a failure point. If the battery dies, you know, you, you don't have any data. And so I, I still carry waterproof field notebooks, you know, when I'm in those situations. But usually when I'm in the office, I, I've kind of trained myself to type them. Yeah. Because it's searchable, you know, you can pull it up. But I, I miss that feel. I like, the, well, I mean, be, being engineering, I love graph paper. I'll just be, I'll just put that out there. All of my notebooks are graph paper. That's a throwback. That's yeah, awesome. So. <laughs> so the field notes I buy, it's, it, I, I don't know if I should plug the brand, but they offer it graph paper or, or just lined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I buy yeah. the rule, but you, the yeah, graph no, paper stuff is No, cool. yeah, like all my notebooks are, you know, it's like those, the binding. That not binders, but like the um, the bound books, right? There's nice. a few different kind, right? And it's I love the graph. And your kids show up, they're like, "Dada, what's that?" I'm like, <laughs> "That's graph paper." It's like you know, it's like there trading them. Graph young. paper no more? No, not as much. But they're like, "Dad, this is this is great for drawing things." Like this is yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Because yeah, that was it was good for. I remember like geometry in school. Like you could really get a polygon in that way. And I'm, I don't know. I'm, can't do that unruled. No, or on a computer drawing it out freehand. Right. So, Not at all. I yeah. had some really sloppy MS Paint failures in my life. But so sure. back back to the the electronic medical record. Cool. You know, there's there's parts of it that you know sometimes you know, make you want to pull your hair out. <laughs> but you know on the flip side you you have these efficiencies of you know there's this convenience of you just go to the pharmacy and it's right there and it's much it, uh, the, managing all the data and everything else I'm sure is much easier. Yeah. But the flip side of that is. And this kind of gets at the differences between conventional and like the new tech way. Yeah. Um, it, you know, if you give somebody a script, they can't really forget about it. And it's almost like a to-do list. Like, okay, I have my three scripts. So these are three things that I need to do. Can't lose these or I'm totally screwed. Yeah. Or, yeah. but you, it's just, they, you know, they walk out and they're like, okay, I need to do some physical therapy. I'm going to be taking some leave. And, um, you know, there's this piece of paper of, I have to follow up again in six weeks to see how I'm doing. And the, you know, as we go paperless, you know, it's, yes, the prescription was sent over there, but if that wasn't entirely clear, it's easy for them to sometimes miss it. So, you yeah. know, it's a communication thing. Like, well, you have to be really careful how you communicate things now. I think I might have mentioned last time we spoke. Well, that makes a lot. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to gloss over that. But I think I mentioned last time we spoke, my brother uh, has, like, a healthcare IT company. Okay. And so I, um, I sort of worked with him on a couple of problems, like, early on in it. And... Um, one of the big things was like improving, uh, and I'm going to get some of the terminology wrong just because it's not my field, but reaching out to patients after the fact, you know, for, um, I don't know if aftercare is the right word, but, but just like following up, right? Yeah, no, that's follow-up care, yeah. Yeah, follow-up care. And it's care. so important It's because it, it's part of like that patient experience. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, it just seems like people forget. And, and I mean, certainly UPMC does, like, because I might piece to pee, like every other one in town has been absorbed by that network. And so, I mean, I, I get those automated texts that I, I don't use because I'm pretty good with calendar reminders, but okay. I, I can see how those would improve outcomes and, you know, just reduce the amount of no-shows. I mean, and, and I know that's a different world than surgery, but I, I feel well, like no, it's, it's you know, Now it's, it's like full circle because like this, your, one of your expertise is design, right? And this is just Thanks. having yeah. a system that's well-designed. I think so. <laughs> you know, no, and it's communication and it's like follow-up is, it's, we look at this as good patient care. And it's, you know, there's many different ways to do that. But, you know, coming up with good follow-up to make sure that the ball isn't dropped and that all the details are sort of checked off becomes really important. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it, I guess if you go back to the numbers game, even if someone like me that's anal retentive, you know, gets a little bit annoyed because they have an extra text, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done because the benefit far outweighs that. I mean, you yeah. know, a lot of people are getting helped. So. You know, and it's also, it's... One of the other fun, des this is a, the design challenge with all this, is that you've got um, many different generations that have many, or, or even just people in general that have many different levels of, uh, of familiarity with tech, right? And so, you know, if you take, and I'll use myself as an example, I, I am not into social media as much, right? And so, me like, yeah, like, I, you know, you give me like, uh, you know, what you, you name whatever social media thing, and I'm like, ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, 
the that's a great way to reach out and communicate with somebody that's you know i'm going to be completely general like make a complete generalization that somebody that's a little bit younger sure no no that, I, that does the social too. media stuff all the time right that's a perfect way to get a hold of that i don't think there's any deny it. i mean you know and, and i think you and i more it's than a, our parents grew up with technology i mean the yeah. fact we talked about programming graphing calculators last oh, time yeah, yeah. and i mean you know the fact that like you know the newer generations i mean they have baby apps you know that and you've seen them i mean you have kids and so I don't know if you give them access to baby apps or not, and I don't need to know or care. I mean, it's your business, <laughs> not mine. But, you know, it's, it, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is, I mean, if you grow up with it in your hand from being a baby, you're probably going to be more proficient with it. And, yeah. and also, you know, it's going to be just... But it also, that also shows how well they're designed, right? Because yeah. if a three-year-old can figure out, and, you know, like, so, you know, there's, a, you know, following the, the American Academy of Pediatrics, there's a small amount of screen time in our household. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see how motivated, you know, somebody that's two or three or four becomes when they're like, this is very interesting. But that it's these intuitive gestures with, you know, whatever tablet or whatever you want to use yeah. that, you know, even a two-year-old can figure this out. Like, that's, that's, awesome. that's a good, you know, that's good design. Yeah, when I've been, I feel like a two-year-old since I, I told you I just bought an iPhone and I'm switching from an Android. I want to get into like, the reasons why. How do we do this? That's exactly it. I'm flailing my arms. I'm sending people texts that look like I'm 90 years old. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm embarrassing myself quite a bit trying to get the hang of this thing, but not lose productivity at work, which I mean, it's inevitable. I'm going to lose some. So I finally made the leap. Like I want to say, like three days ago, I switched my SIM card into it. Uh -huh. So I went from the, the training wheels to now I'm riding the bicycle wobbly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's starting to become more and more natural. And so I, I've, I've just been honest with it. I mean, I'm like, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I'm not great at this thing yet. I'm trying my best. You know, I will get there. Please bear with me. <laughs> it's you know, yeah, it's and, like trying to figure out how to use a tablet for the first time. Exactly. And I mean, it's um, it's getting easier. And, and one of the engineers I work with had a, had a pretty good quote, which I feel, I think it's worth repeating. He said, it's like magic. It just gets easier. Yeah. Because he made the same transition, you know. So I thought that was well. You know, that's the so I um so you know I grew up in the age of Windows, and so my background yeah. was you know everything was on the Windows side, and you know I when, when during my PhD when I was doing a lot of stuff over at, uh, at CMU with robotics, you saw everybody walking around with their Mac laptop. Well, you were in the RI as well. I didn't even know that. Oh yeah, this was like forever ago, right? Because still, because that was like computer the vision part. Yeah, I mean, it's been around long before you were there. <laughs> And um, so everyone's walking around with their Mac laptop and I'm like, well, I probably, you know, this is probably a really good laptop because everybody here knows, really knows what they're doing. Um, and so at, when I was a resident, I got a Mac laptop. But what okay. made me do the jump was that's when they came out with the Intel chip. And so with boot camp, you know, you could do both Windows and the Mac OS simultaneously. That's cool. And, um, you know, which now they're not, you know, they're not using that anymore. So I guess that's kind of fall by the wayside, but yeah. it was a really great way to make the transition because in the beginning I had a Mac, yeah. it was a laptop. It was great when you ran into somebody from IT, they're like, oh, you have a Mac. I'm like, oh no, 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 look, it's Windows. That's awesome. No, no, no I'm one of you. It's yeah. cool. That's cool, man. <laughs> but you know, slowly yeah. you kind of learn how to use everything. And then all of a sudden everything is now Mac. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I get, so I experienced that like a few days ago just to get meta with it. I, um, I noticed there was there were some integration issues on the calendar, so I just yeah. I just bit the bullet and installed Google Calendar again, and you know yeah. I was like, all right, well, this can't, is can't do everything at once. Yeah, yeah I'm already <laughs> used to this. You know, let's 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 wean ourselves that direction, and you know I don't want to be that guy that's so resistant to change. I don't learn any new things, so it does feel good to go outside the comfort zone. But at the same time, you know you don't want to be so you know obsessed with change that you're you're sacrificing productivity and and you know reliability at work so it's, it's an interesting line to, to walk and I feel like I mean it, it goes back to the surgery thing too or the EMR because I mean all that stuff it's a, it's a new tech that I'm sure there's a huge learning curve on and yeah. a lot of people probably throw their tablets across the uh, the room like in heated situations I mean I have never seen it I don't know if that's the case <laughs> but I can imagine just based on the stuff I grew up around and I've seen from people I've known in the medical field like it well, this is like now full circle, right? Because there's a new tool, like how do you how do you start to bring it into the clinic and 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 and, and migrate to like a new set of technology? Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm always interested with, you know, so for the medical records, like when, uh, you know, the IT department brings in like this, you know, new piece, you know, they're upgrading something. Um, that, that's got to be on the back end of that has to be so technically challenging <laughs> to make sure that it like it just goes off without a hitch, right? Like, I mean, it's. If, if it's hard, I mean, this would be a really interesting topic. You know, if there's, there's a few, there's, there's very few different completely independent types of 
um, electronic medical records, right? There's X, Y, and Z, right? And so if you're using X and you're now switching over to Y, like it's hard enough to go between Google and Apple yep. for your for your your for your your for your mobile phone, right? <laughs> How do you do that for the entire healthcare system? Like, what oh, kind gosh. of problem is that? Yeah, and like, not only do you have to teach people the new system, but you have to migrate the old data yeah. and then not lose track of anybody's orders yeah. or and just files or, or care. Uh, yeah, that's an, that's an incredible challenge. You know, and, and that's sort of what's been happening over the last decade between the paper charts to uh, electronic medical records, it's that it's, it's always, it's like one more step each, you know, you know, okay, we got this down, so here's like the next step where it's now a little bit more paperless. And Epic's just getting rich the whole time. Or, <laughs> or, or, or Epic, Cerner, <laughs> you know, there's a whole bunch, you know, the VA health system, you know, the touché, old classic. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you have like the old school Atari, we've got like Nintendo 8-bit, <laughs> we've got <the> Sega. <laughs> yeah, you're right, the pie is big enough to share. Right? Yeah. So it's, it's almost, I don't want to say, maybe it's an oligopoly, I don't know. But. Yeah, which is now like the Raspberry Pi like floating around in there. <laughs> yeah. Is the Raspberry Pi like a gaming system these days? Is it considered that? The, we, yeah, so, so, so just because we, we kind of know what we're talking about. So the yeah. Raspberry Pi being this like super small, uh, really inexpensive computer. Yeah, so what, is, what are they going for? You can get one for like, I think south of 50 bucks now. I, I, I think that's... I, like I, a two I, gigabyte I, would be like oh, gonna, It's amazing how much cheaper yeah. they've become. And right? I'm sure like 10 years from now, we're going to sound like dinosaurs because there'll be something crazy. Like out. $10. You know, yeah, like, or like inflation will offset that or something. And, you know, like, I can't believe you could get a house for $400. And Which is now, now <laughs> merging, you know, merging our topics of design, uh, AI, and robotics because you can do all these great things with, you know, some type of small control system of sort, some sort doing all this. Yeah. No, it's incredibly cool stuff. It definitely takes a village and spans so many disciplines. I mean, it's it's interesting stuff. Like, I don't know. I mean, I like to think both of us have kind of probably played in more ponds than the average person. Yeah, I, I'm just as long as I can keep on, you know, have uh, inventing some. You know, it's it's a lot of fun uh, getting to see these new tools and this new technology coming through and seeing where it works and where it doesn't. Well, work. I agree. And I was going to say, even as a roboticist, where I mean, I, I, I look at circuit boards, I look at computer code, I look at, like, not as much, admittedly. We have other people on the team that are very, very good at handling that. But I also look at, like, mechanical engineering pretty closely and then systems engineering yeah. to tie it all together. But, you know, in spite of having, you know, a pretty good understanding of all those subdisciplines, like, I'm not as good as a straight-up electrical engineer at, you know, making circuits. I mean, I'm not as good as a straight up mechanical engineer at doing geometric dimensioning and tolerancy. Yeah. I'm not, you know, as good as, you know, so, not nearly as good as so, even though I have a degree in computer science. I mean, the, the amount I've learned from when I was in school versus on the job, I mean, it's, it's orders of magnitude. And, yeah. and you kind of express the same. Stuff. Well, it's, um, you know, it's, this kind of gets it like higher level engineering stuff where when I was a chemical engineer, you know, I looked, I was very chemical engineering oriented, right? This is a mass transport problem. This is a thermodynamics problem. Um, you know, this is some type of um, force diagram, Yeah. right? And, you like know- The free body. The free body diagram, yeah. right? Well, yeah, I'm just you. trying to make sure- Well, I'm, 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 listen, I'm a chemical engineer. I'm not a mechanic. It's all right? good. Yeah, touche, touche. Yeah. <laughs> the last time I did a free body diagram was in a systems engineering class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's degrees. get this out. You know, yeah. or if this is a process control issue. And, you know, I, I, I sort of started to notice this because, you know, sort of process control, our, our control class. Fascinating. So, yeah. Tool, and it's way. basically like, how do you have the signal input control some type of, you know, and so chemical engineering, a, a really simple solution, a, a really simple problem for process control is you want to control the uh, flow through a pipe, right? Yeah. You know, it's going from one reactor to another in a chemical process, right? In a chemical plant, yeah. right? And so... How do we take whatever, you know, we have the signal of whatever that somehow is monitoring flow. Yeah. How do we loop that back to control the, the input for the pipe to, so that there's always this constant flow coming through? That's awesome. And it was taught by a nuclear engineer, <laughs> right? Which actually made a lot of sense. Well, like, does, right? First, you're like, why is it nuclear? And I'm like, well, you know, process control would probably be really important. Well, if you're and those guys engineer. are rightfully so uptight. Like, and I, I yeah. say that with, with affection and respect. Yes. I mean, they dot every I, they cross every T. Yeah. I mean, have you ever read like a nuclear design spec? Like, no. Recently, uh, for stuff I can't get into, I've been doing some research into that sector. And I mean, just the stringency with which the- Oh, uh, it's gotta be ridiculous. It's insane. I mean, like I'm not, I don't wanna get too political, but like 
I don't normally believe in like a ton of government oversight over like, you know, just technology and stuff that has to move fast. Because yeah. like you said, you know, we had a lot of people moving. It just kind of has a tendency to slow things down and make them more expensive, in my opinion. But I think in the case of nuclear, the implication <laughs> that, of it goes on is so okay. dangerous. <laughs> yeah, in fact, some would say it's We necessary. like details. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so even though it's, you know, it's incredibly expensive, like you look at a camera for nuke for like going into a spent fuel pool, which is where they keep, um, you know, used up like fuel from nuclear. And I'm sure I'm going to get hate mail from nuclear engineers on this. <laughs> not a nuclear engineer, but as a robotics engineer looking into that field, you know, a spent fuel pool is, is basically, it's, it's, it's a bunch of water, and it, it's usually in a nuclear power plant. And underneath that water, and I can't remember the exact height, but it's because water attenuates, like, the radiation. And so, uh, to make it safe, you put the fuel rods underwater, and there's a big overhead crane that drops them down in there. But there's all sorts of stuff that can go wrong. And so, you know, and, th and this stuff has to last for... I don't know the duration, but a long time. <laughs> like, that's a safe answer. How long does it need to work? Very long. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, I don't know the exact answer, no. answer. And I'm sure nobody does. I mean, with some of this, like maybe we do. Like, cause I mean, we know the half types, half lives of these ice, and I'm getting out of my discipline here a little more than I probably should. But at the same time, I mean, you know, that stuff can't go wrong. I mean, it would be catastrophic to the human race, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. Everybody has a PE, if, I mean, you're familiar with that credential. You yeah. obviously are. You're yeah. a professional engineer, yeah. yeah which so, civil engineers don't need to do. So, yeah, and yeah. neither do robotics engineers. Yeah. None of us have PEs. Um, but civic, civil engineers will yeah. seem to have them. I think because they're dealing with, like, bridges and stuff yeah. where a lot of people will die if it breaks. Um, there's electrical engineers that we've worked with that have them, mechanical. Yeah, I assume the nuclear engineers will get them. The nuke guys all have them. It's, yeah. it's like, you know how when you go to a bank, everyone's a VP because yeah. they have to be able to sign off on stuff? Yeah. yeah it's, I feel like it's like that. It's like you can't get anything done unless you can sign off, so you got to have a PE. But so circling back in then, the whole point of the nuclear engineering, it's that's when I kind of first <laughs> realized that, the, you know, when you're a chemical, you know, whatever subspecialty you've got, um, that really like it's engineering science, right? They, they have these broad kind of concepts in engineering, like thermodynamics, mass transport, process control, where, you know, yes, I learned it as a chemical engineer, but the, the electrical engineers or the mechanical engineers <laughs> were learning like the exact same things, just with a different spin and flavor on it. Oh yeah. Right. And then, so you go to grad school and you know, my thesis had nothing to do with chemical engineering. It's nice computer vision. Uh, which is in, in machine learning, which is awesome. classically very electrical engineering oriented, right? And you're like, oh, it's just like the same ideas, but now a little different. Wait, is it like I, I never thought of it that way? So I always thought of machine learning as a software. It's probably just when I, you know, was exposed to it. Yeah. So is, was it like op apps? So like, how did that work from an electrical perspective? Well, it's you know, I, the all the sort of the classical stuff in on the machine learning or the classification side. It's you know at very you know I'll. I'll I'm sure there's different ways to look at this, but sure. you know, became it, it like the experts at the time were in electrical engineering. It was an electrical engineering problem. It's like this kind of you know, it's, it's some type of filter of some sort that's going in, and you're figuring this out, and you know, this is that what the filter sense. is, and this is what your output's going to be. So it's a lot like controls engineering. Yeah, is almost what it sounds like. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting way of looking at it. It's a it's it's a control. It's you know, this is a process control issue of we have an input. There's a black box. Yep. And, you know, we're we going to have our output. output. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. How do we get there effectively? And so what variables can we tweak to make that better? Yep. Or even better, how can we get them to tweak themselves to, to optimize? Well, them? I mean, it's going to be the same thing with robotics then. Because, you know, it, it, this is kind of going into, like, what's your black box? Is it, you know, is it having the some type of really complex AI algorithm that you've already trained to know how to, like, change things around to give you the right output? Or is it some kind of classic, you know, like whatever filter or, you know, like a, like a really classic problem that's already been solved where you could yeah. do it with a slide roller? My, my instinct as an engineer is often to go to back to, I guess, base principles, or I'm probably using the wrong word, but I like to keep it as simple as possible. And so I'm not a big fan of, uh, earlier in my life, I was like, I, 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 the first robot I ever built, I was, I was a kid, I was maybe like 12 or 13 years old. And um, before that, it was like one that was just simple circuitry and, and it got little micro switch feedback. I actually made an instructable with basically that design on it. It's, it's, see, a lot of people seem to like it, which is nice. But the first one I built a microcontroller in it. I, I remember I got a basic stamp and now I'm dating myself from uh, the shop teacher at high school. <laughs> and uh, you know, he's like, oh, you're pretty smart. Maybe you can do something with this thing. And so I, I, I just, my instinct was to put every single sensor on it. I had, 
and every single sensor you can get as you know a kid with you know the money at, your parents are willing to give at you. Radio Shack. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's one called oh, store.com. Yeah, I miss yeah. it too. I I, I, I did this that uh, back Santa corner. Claus. Oh, it was nice. Yeah. Did you did you hit him when they closed and get the ninety percent off stuff? No, we missed. But I, you know, it's you know. So then you had to get another tangent here. No, the That's my good. favorite this is part. Fun. I'm liking this. The, my favorite part. You know, this is like making everybody super nostalgic. My favorite part of the Radio Shack was the back of the store. Oh yeah, where There's you drawers, just have right? the drawers and just like like things that you're like I don't even know what this does, but <laughs> that looks like I'm gonna take one of those because it's a buck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're know, like this is five dollars. Like yeah. I don't know what I'm gonna use this for. But I know I'm going to use this someday. Uh, and they would kind of tell you on the box. You yeah. could sort of get an idea of what you'd be able to make with it. Yeah. <laughs> and then you'd figure it out or or not. <laughs> no, and, and there's so many times where it's like um, we were, um, I forget what I was doing with my kids. And, you know, we just needed like a little motor for something, right? Yeah. And I'm like, where am I going to go buy a motor? Right? Like the little, yeah. you know, like the little like eight it. volts that, you know, and you could get like the little battery cassette holder yeah, for it and the things. wires and, the you know, like teach them how to solder. And oh, yeah. You know, and that's, you can, that's a great bonding experience it, for it's, sure. Yeah, no, it, it's like this, it's just like kind of walking to the Home Depot. Like, I've got this problem. You're like, whatever hardware store. Yeah. Like, I have this problem. I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to find it or solve it. But I know that if I go to the hardware store, that's awesome. like, I'm going to walk around a little bit. I'm going to see a solution. You know, like, the, you're building something. You're like, I need some pieces of electronics. Don't know how I'm going to do this. <laughs> but I know if I go to Radio Shack... The answer will be there, <laughs> and it's it's really interesting because I I feel like I still approach personal problem projects a little differently than I approach work projects because if you've got a client's you know if somebody else's money or, or resources or timeline are at stake you don't want to make any mistakes and so you're very methodical yeah. and you use very you know expensive components and senior grade talent but if you're doing it as an individual and you, and you're just doing it kind of for fun and yeah. you want to you want to save money and you want to also just see if you can do it. Like I also get inspired just by like I'll, I'll these days I'll go on Amazon and I'll be like I wonder what could do this yeah. <laughs> by like a pump for like this so like recently I put together like a little garden in my apartment that will take um, it'll water plants every day and I, you know I, we're both pretty busy people and I imagine you more than me but you know in, in my own life I, I don't have time to water these plants all the time so yeah. Uh, every morning at like 7.30 a.m., uh, this water spigot turns on. It it's actually goes to a filter and then a valve, and then there's another valve just in case it malfunctions so that my place doesn't flood. Yeah. And so, um, which I guess is kind of an engineer thing to do. But um, anyway. Uh, so, see, it's interesting that you bring this up because, you see, so I didn't want to buy an automatic sprinkler system. <laughs> nice. But I got really tired of doing lawn care stuff with our yard, right? And so yeah. I, too, went to Amazon. That's awesome. And, you, know, you, you buy a few extra automatic sprinklers. You know, probably like, got the same solenoids. Yeah, it's like, it's like ag surplus, right? You know, yep. where it's like you've got like these agricultural sprinkler heads, right, that you can put into certain spikes that you can put into the ground. And you buy a few extra hoses and you get your, you know, you get the, um, That's cool. the hose... You know, it's like the multiple hose setups where like it'll turn it on for so long and it's you know, it's it's like ultimate play, right? Yeah. It's 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 a process control issue for sure. to water your lawn and it's a lot of fun because you didn't know how you were gonna do this and you just sort of figure it out. Yeah, and it's awesome. It's like it's just it's plain, right? Yeah, exactly. And you almost have to unplug, I think, from the discipline that you do in your in your professional life to, to enjoy that, you know. Yeah. Like, like as I've been gardening lately, just to kind of unwind, I mean, it helps me get ready for bed. Like, I'll, I'll trim these plants and, you know, it'll, it'll just kind of, my brain will be able to just, you know, chill out just enough that I can sleep. You know, I have a few other things, but that's one of them. And, um, you know, I, I have a friend that's like very serious about gardening. He's like, you know, you're doing it wrong. You, you know, you need to get this soil and, you know, really you should consider hydroponics because there's these benefits, you know, and I'm like, I don't want to do any of that. Like, I, <laughs> I kind of want to be an idiot on this one, you know, because I'm liking, you know, just figuring it out, you know, and, and that's kind of it's nice for my mind right now. Yeah, it's it, it's the, um, there, there's something to be said for, it's just, especially on the engineering side, it's just fun to build new things. Agreed. And see what you can do. Yeah. I really like that. So uh, I feel like that's a good note to end on. I know, I mean, that's like <laughs> what, you know, that's like the ultimate, like, you know, it's just fun to build things. Yeah. Because we could, we could dig into so much stuff, but I feel like if we cut it there, that's almost perfect. I'm, I'm completely on board. Cool. Excellent. All right.
Hey, if you like what you just saw, please smash that like button, click subscribe. It's your support that will let us keep doing this. We can improve our production value, start releasing these more often. The more people like it, the more of these we're going to put out. So if you like it, subscribe, tell your friends. Thank you so much. You're the best.